Well, good evening, everyone. I guess we'll get started. Welcome. It's good to see you guys. I've been out of it for a little bit, so uh, um, I've got one more trip uh, this coming weekend, and then I'm here for uh, the rest of September, I think, and then all of October. I'm here, so. I don't know if that's good news or bad news. <laughs> Let's open with prayer, and then we'll, we'll get started. Thank you, Father, for who you are, your unchangeableness, the measure of your love, Father, that its depth and height, breadth and width is unfathomable yet. We're to experience it in ever-growing ways, and we're so grateful for that, that you invite us, and uh, that invitation holds true every day and every moment of that day. So we pause just to say we are grateful and we are thankful. If you had not drawn us in your love, we would not have been able to come. Had you not bid us come, we would still be wandering away from you, and away from the power of your love. And I ask you tonight to grip us experientially deeper and deeper with the power of your love. Let it become controlling of us, compelling of us, and so much more than what it presently is in me and any of us, Lord. So much more of you to know, so much more of you to experience. And it is the longing and hunger and thirsting that's within us to know you that way. Lead us up in our hearts. And help us, Lord, never to succumb to the trap of mindless, mindless religion, heartless religion, religion that is not centered in relationship, a loving relationship with you. Draw us and continue to draw us. Keep centering us and not simply the fact of your love, but the experience of it. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to begin again. I'm going to do again tonight a little bit of what I started last time we were together in talking about the love of God. And then we'll move forward as we progress here in our talks and then uh, go to prayer. Again, the objective is, uh, is for us an intimacy with the Lord, a greater intimacy with the Lord. That's our objective, to know him. And uh, that's his invitation to us. And if, you know, there's something that I think is really important for me to understand, I think for all of us, one of the first battles we need to fight is this battle concerning the love of God. Because we're going to be battled over that issue greatly. And uh, it's not going to be a quick fight. Most things aren't. But it's a necessary fight. And what I mean in victory is perhaps not simply, well, it's over now, as much as a place is secured in our heart that is beyond the fact, even scripturally, that God loves us to where it is a reality. And I'm living from that anchor for my soul that the love of God is real because I've experienced him in it. And that's an ever-growing reality in depth and height and breadth and width. But to be a reality, God's love must move past the fact of it, even scripturally, though it's truth. Truth must become an experience. Christ is the truth. But you guys know that that's not something simply written. It is a relationship with him who is the truth. Same thing with love. In all matters concerning God really is coming out of a relationship where we are knowing him, we are experiencing him in that very reality. Love that controls, that grips us, 
controls in this sense to where we understand that we are at all times, in all circumstances, all situations, loved of him. And it's key. Because you guys know life is made up of some very good situations and some very rotten ones. <laughs> Both. <laughs> and regularly. So just as assuredly as the situations are going to be there on sometimes a daily, definitely weekly basis, we need that confidence that comes in knowing him and his love. Anchoring us in all the tests, all the trials, all the tribulations that come with life. So it's very key that the love of God would control me when I want to run, when I want to give up. That kind of control is beautiful. God's not a control freak, but I want the kind of control that makes me to understand, no, no, this is not, this, this situation is not God saying to me, he doesn't love me. That's not what this means. And so where I reinterpret, so to speak, everything that's happening according to the love of God, I want that right interpretation. Certain situations, you know and I know, it's hard to see the love of God in that. Wouldn't you agree? Mm -hmm. Some things are really tough. Really tough. I mean, all, uh, we who are older in the room, which is most of us, have lived long enough to see some tough situations. And uh, there's things that I still don't know all the whys. I may never know until, and I don't think it's going to be a number one question, by the way, when I get in his presence. <laughs> because what gets resolved in me is this. I know he loves me. I'm, I'm assured and certain of that fact. So whatever's going on, I might not be able to tell why the why of it right now, but uh, I'm assured internally that my father is a loving father, and he does not change. It's just true. So then whatever's on our plate for the day, even if it's the valley of the shadow of death, we can fear no evil. Walk right through it. Because he's with us. Isn't that true? Yes. And a lot of us have been through the valley of the shadow of death. In different ways. And uh, I was talking to uh, Rod a little bit. Teresa lost her brother yesterday. Isn't that right, brother? So valley of the shadow of death. Those are some of the toughest things. And especially if you know that that person you love is not right with the Lord. That's a tough situation. <clears throat> but uh, nevertheless, we're going to go through tough situations we all know this, God never told us that it's going to be an easy road. He did tell us he'd be with us. And I believe him. And it has not been an easy road. I don't expect it to be easy. Do you guys? I'm sure you don't. But he is with us. So and I just want to stay with him as I go through these things, not run. So the love of God compels, the love of God controls. By the way, that's 2 Corinthians 5.14, if you're looking for that passage where Paul talks about that, the love of God that constrains or compels or controls us. Having concluded that one died for all, therefore all died is the context of the passage. But I zeroed in on that fact that there's a compelling, constraining assurance of God in his love. You can go through all that what, what you see in the New Testament there, and they still went through it knowing the whole time God loves us. Mm -hmm. And uh, bound up in these tests and trials is a heart of a father who wants us to know more about him and his love. And this is a way to it. Isn't it true that sometimes the hardest things we learn more about God than any other time? I may know that that's true. It's just true. In fact, I'm afraid sometimes when it's easy for me, I lose sight of how much I need him. And I, I, I think that's the greatest danger. You know, when we think we can make it without him. And, and it's just, it's a sad state. So uh, let's move forward then. This, let's look at uh, 1 John for a little bit here. <clears throat> and then, uh, well, actually, let's start in Ephesians 2, and then we'll go to 1 John. There's kind of a, a companion passage here that I want us to look at. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 4, uh, these are precious, two precious words here in the beginning of verse 4, depending on the version you have, but it's probably 
pretty much the same. But God. How many times does that appear in the Bible? But God. Uh, we could write our own story. We would all not be here, but God. <laughs> Is that not true? But God, we'd have been toast a long time ago. We'd have been destroyed. The enemy would have had his way with us and killed us. But God. And um, that's quite the testimony of the Lord when you look at that. We all have every day, really, that testimony. We're here because of God's love, God's care, God's concern. We have a heavenly Father who loves us. He doesn't just love Jesus in you. He loves you. It's important to make that distinction. There's a, there's a twist in things that I've seen where I would only, only love Jesus in you. There's no truth to that. The scriptures bear the opposite out as truth. God loves us, you. He loves you. He loves his creation. So he loves you as a created part of the creation, but it's deeper than that. You know, this is interesting truth. We're not, this isn't really my strong purpose here, but I'll just touch it to say this. For us, it's not as though God just simply created a being. It's more like begotten. He breathed into us. That's not said of any of the rest of the creation. Something very unique went on. That's the image issue. He breathes into a being. The breath of lives, that's what it says. Which gave us the ability to procreate. The breath of lives. That's only one layer of that meaning of that. That he began a creation that could continue to produce. So Adam would have an extended family in his wife, right down to us. So something very unique took place when God no longer simply creates, as he did even the angelic order. He did the holy ones that way. He created them, the seraphim, the cherubim. He never breathed the breath of life or lives into them like he did man. Interesting. It's a lot attached to that. I know I'm barely touching it. And I'm not doing it justice. But, I, but see the love of God in that. See the potential for relationship in that. That can know. A, never said this about any other being either. Can know the depth, height, breadth, and width of the love of God. That surpasses understanding. All connected to original intention and purpose. All of this is interconnected with this great loving heart. Who is behind everything he does and more of a heart than anything else. God is not, I've said this, God is not purpose driven. He is motivated by the power of his love. Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So once that, once, again, this is experiential, but, but it begins with that seed where there's such hopelessness in the world, where the seed of hope comes from the light of the knowledge of God's heart and love. And it gets implanted into you. If we let that take root and let it become an experience with him, a living relationship experienced every day, we will find our journey with God and his purpose. All of us have purpose bound up. You're not created without intent. First and foremost, though, it's to be with him. Then secondly, there's purpose that is eternal. It begins here, but it has no end. But that's bound up first and foremost with the relationship. Isn't that beautiful? So God, I say this to you, God's more interested in you than he is the purpose attached to you. And he'll put the purpose on hold to save you. Isn't that beautiful? We'd do that with our children, <laughs> wouldn't we? So that's, uh, we're dealing with a heavenly father who is not like any earthly father we've ever even known or heard about. There is no earthly father that can compare with God in his fatherhood. And by the way, fatherhood was never spoken of until the creation of man. That word was never used, never known. It came into reality when we were created. He fathered something. He didn't just create it. He fathered it through breath. Impartation of life. Of his own. 
So uh, um, that goes to a whole other level than when you consider the born again element, becoming born again, and God coming to live actually inside. So no longer is it simply the breath of life. I'm saying this to us. We're way beyond Adam, those of us who are born again. Way beyond the breath of life and all the beauty of that. We're to a whole nother level of God's love that's intermingled with God's desire to have a creation that he could fully share himself with, give himself to. Thus, fatherhood, marriage comes into view. And this is what we fight. This is the battle that must go on. We must allow the Holy Spirit to make that real to us. It's not just generic, guys. God loves us. It's not good enough. God is in love with you. If only you would have turned to him, he'd have still made the same sacrifice. Numbers was not the deal. You were. You have to let that hit your heart. If it only been you, who would have said yes? He'd have never hesitated. In fact, I'm convinced of this. If no one would have said yes, he'd have still done it. It's just in his nature. It's who he is. You can't stop him from being the loving God that he is. Nor do we want to. <laughs> what we want to do is enter into that relationship. So, behind everything that is going on in Christianity should be, seldom is, but should be, this motivation of the love of God compels us. Compels me toward him. Not to run and hide like Adam and his wife, but to run to him. Have a problem? Come boldly before the throne of grace that you may receive help. Don't try to get cleaned up and then go. Get cleaned up by going. <laughs> See the difference? Because we've been taught something totally different, haven't we? You know, the way for help is to go to him. The way to not be helped is I got to fix this. You won't ever be able to fix it. He can. I can. Isn't that true? So what this becomes a, 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 a different constitution internally within me, within you. Constitution that tells me this. I'm in trouble. I run to my father. I said this, I think last time we was here, you know, if we'd have known this when we were children, I don't know if you got spanked like I did, more like a whipping, really wasn't a spanking, <laughs> but I, I needed it. You know, we used to, dad would grab us and he would, he'd get the, the belt and he'd be whipping us and we'd be running in circles, kind of a moving target. <laughs> you know, three licks turned into usually five because we wouldn't stand still. You know what I'm saying? So, but the better way is just grab your father by the legs and cry out to mercy for him, from, from him. Just grab him by the legs, get as close to him as you possibly can, grab his legs and just, oh, Dad, I love you. And it's, it's really hard to hit somebody when they're in that position. <laughs> it really is in the natural. But notice what you do. What you do with your father is you grab him in love. I love you. See, that's different than trying to play ring around the rosy with your father, who knows everything. We're not going to hide anything, nor should we want to, because he's the source of forgiveness and mercy and grace. So why not run toward him? If we're in trouble and that's the answer the answer is always closer not distance distance creates a problem a bigger makes a problem bigger than what it is intimacy always remedies the problem wouldn't you agree yeah. so may god reprogram me may he reprogram us reprogram us to move toward him that's the great invitation come to me all you who are weary heavy laden I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. See, there's the problem. It's if I don't know who he is in his love, I run from, I hide. I feel shamed, condemned. Just right into the trap of the enemy. And if you ever feel condemnation, just know this. God has never condemned you. Ever. And he never will. In the way we're receiving it at that time. That is the enemy's work. God does not use condemnation to draw us. Love draws. Kindness leads us to repentance. That's the scripture. So <clears throat> what we've got to fight is that battle. What is his nature? And his nature is not what so often we made his nature to be. 
And so we must be compelled by the inward nature of our Father. Whatever God's going to do through us needs that right motivation of love. Don't you agree? And when it has the right motivation of love, and not really me for him, but the love of God through us, the kindness of God, the concern of God, the burden of God, the purpose of God, the plan of God, the intention of God through us, there's no sweat in that because it's him through us. You know, loving God is an impossibility unless you're receiving from the love of God. You can't love God without the love of God coming into us first. It's an impossibility to love him without receiving his love. We love because he first loved us. Simple statement. So that's what we want to see here in Ephesians chapter 4. But God, if you read what's the context here, it talks about our former lives in verse 3. And how we lived in the lusts. But verse 4, but God. But God what? Being rich in mercy because of his great love. There it is. There's an adjective there before love. That's a beautiful adjective. A descriptive word magnifying the word love. Great love. So we're dealing here with great love. And uh, it's better expressed later. And in, when he, Paul talks about in the same book, when Paul talks about death, pot, breath, and width, an unfathomable amount of the love of God, but no longer the love of God as creator to creation, is Paul talking about. Paul's moved further in his understanding, in his relationship with God, into the love of God that we were designed and purposed for. Marriage. That's what our design was not a creator created love. We have that by created act, created will. We've been created. He loves his creation. But that's not why we were created. We were created for marriage. We were created for a depth, height, breadth, and width of the love of God that does not know. I, I, don't, I can't understand its boundary. I don't think it has one. It's depth. How deep is it? How far reaching is the love of God in that arena? We will only know that by experiencing that in the coming age of ages. And it'll go on and on. And it'll never, I believe this, we could go, for us, you know, we relate to time. There'll be no time there. But let's just say it this way, Snow. If we were to go out 100 billion years times 100 trillion years into what we call the future, we would have only begun to scratch the surface of this kind of love. We're meant to go someplace in that realm of love that the created creation has no knowledge of and cannot. And that's by created intent. So uh, that invitation is a stunning invitation. Ladies, if you'd have got that invitation for marriage, you would have never hesitated to say yes. Well, you now have it right from the Father himself. <laughs> Same thing with the men. It's a great invitation to us. And, uh, and I don't think it's been foretold properly. I do not think it's been represented properly. Um, I, I think it's part of the problem we're dealing with in what's called God's people, where that really is the case, where they really are God's people. I'm saying they're born again. I'm not trying to question what God does as much as our low understanding of what it means to be born again and that salvation has come to mean something other than being born again. And so we're dealing with a root problem of people really not even knowing the Lord. But beyond that, people who do know the Lord, what has been portrayed and given to them concerning the love of God? The love of God draws us in. It does. It does not push us away. The love of God anchors us. The love of God is our security. Because there isn't anything in this world that's secure. You guys know that. But God is. You know what I'm saying? Therefore, we have eternal, eternally, one in the heavens who is our security at all times. No matter what this world hands us, no matter what our daily grind hands us, and it's usually a daily grind, or whatever unforeseen surprise circumstances occur, we have a Heavenly Father who loves us deeply, passionately, when you look at the whole of the Scriptures. <clears throat> and uh, so we have this great invitation to come ever deeper into the power of that love. 
The intimacy factor, and that's what we're really after in this, we're after a relationship of intimacy, but the way to intimacy must, uh, this is just a given, must be through this door of love. Must be. Else we're going to find all kinds of blockages to intimacy. And if you're finding blockages to intimacy, ask the Lord if some of those blockages are around this issue of the love of God. Am I experiencing and knowing the love of God that conquers my fears, love that's greater than my faults, greater than my failures, greater than my fears, greater than my sins, greater than my mistakes. Mercy coupled with that love, grace coupled with that love, the forgiveness of God coupled with that, to run to him, to find help in my time of need right at the throne of God. Isn't that beautiful? Not standing in the back somewhere, <laughs> but right there with him. So, you know, that, that draws us. That love, like anyone who deeply, truly loves you, you're going to be drawn to that person. You are. You're going to want to be around that person because of love. That should be true in the body of Christ. We should have that love of God working in us that we like being around one another. Don't you agree? And if we don't like being around one another, what I don't, I'm not trying to be critical when I say this, but most of the time it gets down to some root form of the love of God being crushed either in me or in someone else or both. None of us are perfect here. But we want to move on. And by the way, the word perfect is used one time by Jesus uh, when he's talking about the love of God. It's an interesting thing. A maturity is really what the word's pointing to, a maturity in the love of God. Uh, be you perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That passage is talking about the love of God. Go back and read it. Look at the context. So, uh, I'm, I'm going too long on this one point, <laughs> but it's okay. I, I don't know that we're in a rush in this. We'll take as long as we need to. Because what has to happen here for intimacy's sake is I have to know that he is drawing me in my present condition. Not as he would have me be yet. I'm not going to be as he would have me be till he draws me in my present condition. And in my present condition, he says, come. He's not saying come to me when I have it all right. He's saying come to me right now in my present condition. Isn't that beautiful of him? I mean, in a reality, just you think about this yourself. Would we say that? Not to, we, let's say we'd say that to a few people. Mm -hmm. I'll be positive. We wouldn't say that to everybody. God's saying it to the whole world. Come. There's a heart there, isn't there, guys? I'm saying to you, there's more heart in this. There's more love behind this, what God's doing, than anything else. He is motivated entirely by it, firstly, foremost. If we lose sight of that, and men have to really be careful about this because we can be, ladies, you know this, but we can be purpose-driven. You know, we go, we, we, go, we go on a, <laughs> this is funny, we, we, you know, we go on a vacation and it becomes a quest just to get there. <laughs> Stop and ask for directions, unheard of. <laughs> <laughs> Impossible. <laughs> now, now we have GPS, so we have an excuse. <laughs> but we, we men have to watch it, don't we, guys? We have to watch. There's a good side of that that God put in us. Of course, it's in a fallen state, so that's why we have to let the Holy Spirit help us with this to redeem what needs to be redeemed in this, what God meant for good in it. There's a good dynamic to tasks and finishing them. But if we're not careful, this is true of all of us. We never appreciate the journey. And the goal will never be reached, guys, without the journey. Isn't that true? We're not going to get to God's goal without this journey. None of us. So we better enjoy the journey because the goal is only the other side of the successful journey. And I don't mean that we make an A, straight A's through everything. If that's the case, let's all quit and go home. <laughs> we're, we're not going to get there like that. But we can grow in our knowledge of God through all things. 
even failure is redeemable. And we've proven that to be true. <laughs> I'm way too good at it, I believe so. <laughs> I excel at failure. <laughs> I'm playing. But seriously, when you look at things comparatively, but aren't you thankful that that's not how God grades? And so school didn't help us in some ways. School didn't help us in its competitiveness, in our comparing of one another. School didn't help us there, did it? School doesn't help us in a lot of ways, does it, Paige? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Got that one in, didn't I? <laughs> school lunches certainly didn't help us. <laughs> Actually, back in our day, school lunches were pretty good. <laughs> they used to have real school lunches. But now it's all this other stuff. Well, anyway, <laughs> competitiveness is my point. Competitiveness comes in. And we've got to outperform, or we've got, this comes through our parents. If you had a military family, this really came on to you. Performance or others in that kind of ordered thing. I'm not calling for disorder. I'm saying this, though, that uh, much of that forms in us a failure issue that we carry right into our relationship with God. And then it hangs over us, and we can't see love that's greater than that. We can't see it. We can't experience it. It has to all be like this or we failed God. And that it haunts us. I know that's a terrible, it's a witch word, but it's true. It is witch. It is a bewitching thing. It really is. It'll keep you away from the love of God. It'll keep you away from peace, the peace of God. And man, peace, how, how huge is peace in this? <clears throat> to know you're at peace with him. <clears throat> to where he's not searching for you to give you some kind of beating beyond all description. <laughs> that were case, he knows where we live. I mean, well, we got long to live. But no, that's not who he is. So I'm saying, that, this is why I'm belaboring this point, because I, I want us all, myself included, I want us all to have a breakthrough in our hearts. I'm not putting, this can't be a teaching. We have to have a breakthrough. Don't you want it? I do. I want to know the love of God. And that's an experience. I want it to catapult me into a realm of intimacy. A greater realm of intimacy, like it's meant to. God's love begets something. To experience the love of God begets love. And that's the only way I can love him back, is by experiencing that love. If I don't experience that love, I can't love him. I can't. Human love will never measure up in this. So I am meant, you're meant, to know the love of God. He will not hold, withhold that from you. He's not going to play favorites. If you ask him for bread, he's not going to give you a stone. If you ask him for a fish, he's not going to give you a serpent. Isn't that true? He's going to give you what he wants you to have and me to have more than we want it, the love of God. Intimacy with him. So there's the great battle. That, that's why this may this battle be resolved in us to a degree that we can... We can know him, we can trust him, we can experience him in a beautiful way. So the, the death blow to that which obstructs and veils and resists the love of God in us. That's what we're after, aren't we? To where such a blow is administered by the Holy Spirit that I have a trust now, my Father loves me. Now here's a good exercise. Training, listen. <clears throat> this is First uh, John. Um, the love of God, the, the great love of God, we'll get to the First John passage in a second. The great love of God that Ephesians is talking about here will revolve in First John around that we are children of God. Yeah. Okay? So we are children by new birth of God. We are sons and daughters by training. Two different Greek words are used there. You know what? I'm just bringing it out so that we can look at a, the perspective of it while we're here. We're children by new birth of God. We're sons and daughters. Technon is the, the Greek word for children there. It speaks of an, uh, an infant to early childhood. But an entirely different word is used concerning sons, and it's weos. And that Greek word is implying a mature son. 
You'll notice with me, as you look through the scriptures, if they make a distinction, some of the Bibles don't, but even most of them on several occasions make a distinction, and they should make more of a distinction, by the way, between this issue of child and son. Now, ladies, you guys, the reason it's son is not because God doesn't like ladies. <laughs> There's no truth to that whatsoever. <laughs> it's because it's a family of the son, the son. That's what God's showing us. That family's head is his own son. So we're in the family of the son. So male and female is meaningless in it. That's what, that's what Galatians 3 actually says. In Christ, there is no male nor female. It doesn't exist. That's not my words. That's right out of the scriptures. Jew and Gentile don't exist. Slave and free doesn't exist. There's no such thing. Christ is an entirely other than creation. We are an entirely other than creation. So your phenonymity does not make any difference to God. Now, does that mean man and woman are just alike now? Not in their makeup, but in their spiritual ability? Absolutely. I'm saying this. God can inhabit a woman just as much as he can a man. He can use that woman just as much as he can use a man. Because it's not the vessel. It's the Lord in the vessel. We all know the truth of that. That's a measure of fullness. You cannot tell. I want to hit it this way. Men, you'll, you, ladies, you'll be okay with understanding this. Does a man having very little of the Holy Spirit have a better chance with God than a woman who's full of the Holy Spirit? Or who has the better chance? The woman full of the Holy Spirit. What, what's the difference? The measure of God. The better vessel there is the one full of the Holy Spirit. Not the man and not the woman. The measure will be the issue. So thank God for our differences in the natural. There are differences. Of course there are. There's difference how we understand things, how we see things even. But in the spirit, I'm saying this to you. Never allow your femininity or your masculinity to hinder God from doing anything for you. He is the God of the impossible. And he doesn't care what vessel he operates through. He'll operate through a jackass if he wants to. I mean, what does that say? I mean, he's done, he's done worse. He's used a well in Jonah's situation. So he'll use pretty much what he wants. He uses, he uses vessels that we would not choose on us. <laughs> Doesn't he, Rod? <laughs> Jonah did not want the well, but he needed the well, or he would have died in the ocean. And God was not through using Jonah to do what Jonah didn't want to do, <laughs> which was show the love of God. Isn't that right? To the people he hated, because they had murdered most of his friends, the Assyrians. They had the heads of uh, they had the heads of Israelites on the wall. That's why they do. That's why they would do at that city of Nineveh. They would uh, of their victims. They would have wooden stakes on the walls of the city with the heads of their victims. Many of Israelite would have been on that wall. So uh, yeah, Jonah didn't have fond feelings for them. Some of his cousins would have been on that wall. <laughs> but the love of God's bigger than our natural hates, or. We're not a testimony to God. You know what I'm saying? The love of God in me shows the love of God through me. Is what I'm saying. It's a flow. So, uh, so anyway, back back to my point. <clears throat> let's let's just hit this for a little bit here. As a as a woman, God can do anything He wants to through you. He has no limitation. The only limitation He'll ever have would be on the vessel, what the vessel will allow. That's true with women, and it's true with men. So that's the, that's the important part of Galatians 3, that there's no male nor female in Christ. So we're dealing with a creation now that is not based around a curse. Women, you are no longer cursed. You're not, not in Christ. If you're not in Christ, you are. Men, you're no longer cursed. 
You're in a cursed earth, but you're not in a cursed relationship. There is a difference. So let me be clear, because I can make that statement. We're in a cursed earth. We're not in a cursed relationship with God. In a cursed earth, you still have the sweat of your brow. You still have pain and child labor. Cursed earth. The earth's dying out there. Plants are dying. Everything's dying. We're dying. But you're not in a cursed relationship. In Christ, you have a relationship. Listen to this. As if Adam never fell. What was the original intention of God? To draw you into marriage. Is that not beautiful? It's beautiful, isn't it, Mike? It's what we were made for, all of us. Let me bring out one other point. Had Adam not fallen, we'd have never had any of this problem between male and female. It would never have existed. We'd have never had a racial issue of any type. Racial issues are only in Adam, which shows you the measure of Adam that's still in the church. Isn't that true? Curse. The Lord warned me several years ago. He said, stop doing wedding ceremonies with a cursed relationship. Isn't that funny, Snow? Because what we do is we bring Genesis into view in the cursed relationship without bringing it into Christ. Listen, I want to say this to us. Hear me carefully. Women and men, the right relationship before God in marriage is God at the center, not, your, not the husband. If God is not the center of the relationship, we're in real trouble. And believe me, we're in trouble. <laughs> if the man is the center of the relationship, we're in really bad trouble. If the woman's in the center of the relationship, we're in really bad trouble. God has to be the center. So the Lord showed it to me years ago in concentric circles. The center circle in the old time, on the old time in the fallen nature, the concentric circle, uh, the inner circle was the man, the husband and wife, let's just say it, Husband and wife, not man and woman, husband and wife. There's a difference, as you know. Husband and wife, the center of the relationship. And as the Lord showed it to me, here's what he said. And they're fighting for dominion with each other. <laughs> then he brought it to in Christ. And in this, the concentric circle, inner circle was Christ. The second circle was husband and wife in full submission to Christ. Having their roles... Not denying the difference role of roles. I'm saying so this though. Both were in submission to Christ. And if we have that, you have God's desire. And if we don't, well we need God's desire, <laughs> don't we? If one is submitted to God, yeah. does that make the other under that cover? It or should, it? Snow, don't you think? Yeah, I mean that's yeah, it's meant to. I would say it probably this way, Snow. It gives the opportunity for it. So, and I'm only saying that to say this. Some are in such rebellion that they are unwilling to submit. So, but there's a measure of safety for them if they can go with that. Um, I guess I would have to answer it this way, a yes and no. <laughs> Which is probably, yeah. being honest, guys, what we walk out. Because we can tell when God's getting his way and when he's not. And, and, and it's sad, but that's the case of things. When one of the married people, the husband or the wife, one or the other is with the Lord, and what the scripture says about that is the family is cleansed, so it says. So there's a measure there, but let's say this. But is the here's a real question? But can the government of God be in that situation without mutual submission? Therein is the great test, and I don't envy any of God's people who are having to go through that. It's a hard battle, isn't it? And um, we need to pray for them. Pray God's help and strength. And, and pray that, that the Lord can truly break through the mate. 
There is a special grace. I'll say this, part of the answer, I guess, no. There's a special grace that is released because you're a believer upon your entire family. The dealing of the Holy Spirit is way specific because you're a believer. Remember that. And it's not just your immediate family. It's the bloodline. I've watched it when I was in hell. That's when the Lord first showed it to me. When I had gone down and was being shown things in hell. And uh, because there's such an absence, there is no such thing as grace in hell. It doesn't exist. Nothing that we have every day of our lives have of kindness and quietness is in hell. It's the total opposite of this. This is in heaven. But what we have here is incredible grace. Incredible. We just can't see it. Cool breeze. We, we just take that for granted, don't we, guys? I do. Take it for granted. A kind word. It's not in hell. There's none of that. It is continuous punishment and torture. Just uh, the church has to wake up to this fact. Otherwise, uh, we're not going to fight for the loss like we should. You know what I'm saying? Somebody's got to fight for those people. If it's not us, then who, who in the world is? God's going to fight for them. But he does that through his people. So anyway, having said that, I've watched this because, because of your dedication to the Lord. The grace of God is released within your family in a magnificent, beautiful way. And here's what's beautiful, by the way. You have a loved one who's at the edge of death. Come on. I'm just going to say, come on, state. Nobody can really, really communicate with them. They can hear, but they can't respond. Nobody can really communicate in a way to get them to a point of, do you want the Lord? I've experienced this with my grandmother. Um, and here's what happens. Here's the grace of God at work because of you. The grace of God at work, God comes right to them in the coma state. Yes, Lord. Do you want me? I've seen it. <laughs> so what happened to my grandmother? She was what you would call a redneck extraordinaire. <laughs> Tobacco chewing, drinking, smoking. I could name a lot of other things. <laughs> Despised me from the time I was a child. Just it was what it was. But, uh, you know, when she was in the coma state, I tried to get to her. And uh, she never knew when I came and never knew when I left. And she died, and I was heartbroken for her because I'd prayed for her. And um, so I was after the, her death and burial. I was riding around on my lawnmower, lived in Franklin, and the Lord suddenly appeared to me, and I heard my grandmother laugh. I never heard her laugh my entire life. She had a hard life, real hard. And uh, then the Lord unveiled it. I want you to understand stand something, Terry. While she was in her coma state, I came to her, and she did not say no to me. There's the love of God, and there's the grace of God. So don't underestimate it. Now, that doesn't say, well, don't pray. No, pray. That's what I'm trying to say to us. Grace should cause us to be there for the lost, praying for them, asking the Holy Spirit to deal specifically in ways that we don't always see or understand, and God's an expert at it. I love him for that, don't you? So, you know, those kinds of things you don't know for sure. I, I, you know, Rod, you never know for sure. You don't. Because of you guys. The grace extended to your wife's brother in that moment. I've watched it on several occasions. I'm not saying it always happens. I'm not saying it's a done thing. I'm not. I'm not <laughs> establishing some doctrine. This will always be. I'm saying, though, to you, God in his grace is way more powerful than what we think because you believe. Because you believe. So he gives them a chance. They can still say no, but he gives them a chance. I think he gives them multiple chances. Don't you? Because he loves them. We were in that condition. <laughs> Running, 
I wasn't running toward him. I was running away. <laughs> Weren't you? I mean, maybe you're raised in church. I wasn't. But most people raised in church, the ones I knew were running away. <laughs> Still were running away. <laughs> but love compels. I, I want to say this to all of us in the ring. Get, let God take the monkey off your back of performance and realize everything has a time. Uh, I've shared this before, but let me share it again. Maybe this will help a little bit. Something the Lord showed me years ago was um, the three hands of a clock. Some of you will remember this. And um, on the three hands of the clock, as he pointed to them, the seconds hand, which moves the fastest, the minutes hands, which moves, you know, it's the middle hand moving between the hour hand. So it's speed is what it is. And the hour hand, which moves the slowest. Here's what the Lord told me. He said, I reveal my will in the hour hand, never in the seconds. Mm -hmm. Ever. The will of God is never revealed in the seconds hand, which is the fast moving hand. But the problem is, here's what he said to me back. He said, the problem is you believe that the will of God is, is revealed in the seconds hand. That's what he told me. Mm -hmm. And I do sometimes, Jeff. I believe that sometimes. Foolishly, but I do. Because some things come with such umph. Don't you think, Snow? Mm -hmm. It seems so imminent, so real. It's a bit of a trap to my heart. So I have to, I have to understand something. That when the will of God is revealed, it's revealed within the hour. <laughs> then the Lord went on. He said, the minute's hand is the ways of God. He said, there's the process to the fulfillment of my will is in this minute's hand that's moving around. And then he said, he pointed to the second's hand. He said, there is a moment where all three hands will perfectly align. He said, that's called perfect timing. He said, and it's worth waiting for. <laughs> so there's, there's more than one thing that's involved in the fulfillment of these things it's uh it's all at least three is pointing out by the seconds hand the the minutes hand and the hours hand so i have found in my journey you think it through that god has spoken many things to me such as let's use a shiloh as an example that revelation first came to me uh, way back in 1997 and so uh i became a part of a shiloh in kansas city but that was not really what the Lord was talking to me about. And I knew it, even by going there. Because what the Lord had shown me was quite a bit different. Um, after coming away from that Shiloh, I thought that was over. I thought, it was, and it was a failure. I thought, that's it. <laughs> uh, on top of that, my daughter Shiloh almost died after we left. So it was like a double whammy. She was born, I explained that to you guys, she was born as a sign to us concerning the ministry of Shiloh. Well, that's why we named her Shiloh. And uh, the scripture that God had given me in this experience I'd had about Shiloh when we were living here in Tennessee before ever moving into Kansas City uh, was the Ark of the Covenant came into my room, was carried physically into my room, I was wide awake, and the terror of the Lord was on that encounter. And uh, anyway, it's a long story, but uh, the Lord in that encounter gave me a specific passage out of Isaiah. It's Isaiah 22, 22. And uh, that was my passage of scripture for the ministry of Shiloh. So when my daughter was born um, sometime later, when we moved to Kansas City at St. Luke's Hospital, they put her in room 22, 22. That's what they put her in. And, you know, that's, that's sovereign. So we knew, you know, she was the sign, as all of our children and probably your children have been signs to us, times of life and focuses. So having said all that, um, all these years later, from 97 to this year, we actually buy a property to begin what I'm convinced was in God's heart back in 1997, Shiloh. Shiloh. I don't know all the reasons, but I'm convinced it has to do with the middle hand, <laughs> you know, the ways of God and uh, things about that ministry that I had never even heard until two years ago in the process of God that I could understand. And I'm still learning and I want to forever be a learner. I, I don't think you ever outgrow that. God is too magnificent 
You know, so we're ever learning of him, ever growing, ever maturing. But having said that, thus are the ways of God. I, I, I think, Rod, there's things still in front of me. I know there are. I know things God has spoken to me, probably most of us in the room. God has said, I'm not walking in the reality of that yet. I'm not seeing that come to pass. I've not seen it come to pass. It doesn't bother me. And the reason it doesn't bother me, because I know, Jill, like I feel about you, I don't have disobedience in my heart. But I know I can't make it happen. And if I could, it wouldn't be gone. So my comfort in that is, God, I'm willing. Mm -hmm. um, and in time, at the right time, it will happen. But I'm convinced in most of these things, it demands some things not within our grasp yet. It's out of our grasp and that by the Holy Spirit. So, uh, uh, you know, don't feel pushed into things too quickly. Whenever you're feeling pushed into something, it's usually not the Lord. Now, if it's the Holy Spirit pushing you, it is the Lord. <laughs> but if it's people, it's, not, it's usually not the Lord. If it's just people pushing, uh, pray about that until you feel peace. You have to feel the peace of God. You have to know the timing of God. You know, we all do in that. So, so we walk, that's how, honestly, we're going to walk through this. Know this, though, behind all that is the love of God. And I'm, you know, some of these things he said to me, I've often wondered if they'll ever come to pass because <laughs> they're, they're just so out of reach, it seems to me. But things change, you know, they do. Uh, sometimes suddenly, I never thought we'd own property. But I, here was where I was going to move. I was going to move to a practical side in this of intentionality, being intentional. And uh, there's some things that I think that are just bedrock for us in any realm and applies to this realm. And one of those is this. Focus your attention and your heart upon him who is high and exalted. Be intentional about it. Very intentional. He who is above. Not, let me explain myself. Not, I'm not talking about because of existence. I'm saying this. In all the midst of our circumstances, my, my brethren, we're always being pulled down, aren't we? And these things loom large and in charge. I set my mind upon him who's above. And he is above all things. Isaiah 6, he sees him. I saw the Lord. He was high and he was lifted up above everything. And the train of his robe was filling the temple. Notice what happens in that interchange. Notice it in Daniel 7. When Daniel encounters God or is encountered by God and he sees the throne and he sees God exalted and myriads and myriads are serving him and are around him. And what he's seeing, here's what's important for us. What he's seeing is the one who's above everything. And believe me, in our circumstances, in our battles, um, in every arena, we need to keep this in mind. Satan is going to make himself appear bigger every time. Your circumstances, if he uses them, God will use them too. Satan will use them. He'll use them to make them seem impossible. God will use them to challenge us to believe him for the impossible. Isn't that true? <laughs> Same circumstance. So what is my, how do I have the right perspective? By gazing upon him as I am lifted up. By keeping my focus. I get into battles, you know you do. I get into battles with a lot of witches, Satanists, a lot of demonic um, astro projection. And get into it with uh, principalities just because of the mission. Just because of going. And uh, believe me, one thing you got to keep in mind when you're up against those beings because they, pro they project themselves in such a large way. And I'm not trying to demean them in any way and say, oh, they're nothing. I'm saying this, though. In comparison to God, they are nothing. <laughs> in comparison to me, that's not true. But the one who's in me, the one who's in you, that's, there's, therein is our victory and therein is our strength. So I will give them their due. Okay, you have a measure of authority. I understand that. 
But do you understand this? Your kingdom is going to fall. <laughs> Rubber hits the road right there. I know the one who's high and exalted. He's going to crush all the kingdoms of this world, crush the kingdom of darkness, which you're a part of, bring you and everyone with you down, cast you into the lake of fire forever. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> well, I, I know it's intense, but listen, they don't back down. So you have to you have to get in their face. I've seen it way too many times with these kinds of beings. And you can't do that in human strength. They'll cre they'll cream you. They'll kill you. God takes his hand away your toast. But uh, the focus, if, if we're going to be in serious conflict, or if, let's just take conflict out of the way, but that's true too. Let's just take out of our, just our circumstances. Let's take out of, let's take our past. What's the quickest? We've all had rough pasts at some measure, most of us who are older, because of the generation we came out of. If you're over 50 in the room, that's pretty much true of you. <clears throat> Him high and lifted up absolves the pain of that to a measure to where I can see him more than I can see my past and my pain. Way more. The more I behold him, the more I'm transformed. The more I see him high and exalted above my pain. He's high and exalted above my circumstance. He's high and above, above this principality that's standing over there. <laughs> He's high and above. He's high and above. And that's how I want to see him, because that's how he is. But he's not removed from me. He who's exalted and high and above sits on the throne is also dwelling in us. Isn't that beautiful? So see, the fight that we come into, I believe, you know, Jeff, is more centered around how I'm seeing him high and exalted. Because therein, folks, lies the victory. It's in him who is high and lifted up. Their time may not be yet. Because they tell you that all. I have them tell me that all the time. When they get in a tight situation and you get them cornered, it's not my time. I've heard them say that so many times. <coughs> um, I know that. I know it's not their time. But it will be. And when it comes, we'll be there to see it. <laughs> Participate. <laughs> Seriously. Read Revelation. You'll find it out really quick. Satan in chapter 12 gets cast out of heaven. That includes the second heavens. And he's contained to the earth. So no more second heaven beings. Aren't we going to look forward to that day? Now he's coming down with great wrath. I don't know if I'm much of looking forward to that, but <laughs> wrath is wrath. <laughs> There's two wraths going to go on in that time, though, God's and theirs. But it is there is a normal thing in fighting these beings. And it's like I said, most of that fight is in prayer, peace, faith, a combination. But whatever, uh, for, for I, let me say this for for certain things demand more than that. If we're going into a city, and the objective is the ears and eyes of God's people to open to to a fullness or fuller way to see the Lord, and to see Him behind lifted up, to see Him exalted above everything, that drawing that comes with that, that want to know him. You know what I'm saying? We're battling for that for God's people. Aren't we? I mean, we are. The, the, the nominal church is in a terrible situation of not knowing the Lord. Not knowing the Lord. So we're in a fight for God's own house. So, so what happens then is these beings are contending for their authority that has been given to them by people including uh, church leaders. You know what I'm saying? And therein is the great battle. So uh, to not back down from that fight, which I refuse, if, if the fight, I'm sorry, these things come because uh, they're intimidators mm -hmm. and they want to interrupt anything, anything that's going to dislodge in our hearts a, uh, a place a stronghold 
that um, such as what we're talking about, the love of God. The love of God can dislodge strongholds. Y'all know that, don't you? We, it dislodges from our thinking, from our hearts, that God's a certain way when he absolutely is not. That he's some taskmaster that's driving the sheep instead of leading us to, to gentle waters. <laughs> Isn't that true of him? So these things come to intimidate, but he's blocked. But anyway, I don't like it around, but they're around. So I'm sorry. Uh, he has a right to be here because of the church situation in Dixon. That's why he has the right to be here, you know, but um, only measured right. You know what I'm saying? He furthermore has a right. Can I be really up frank with you guys? He has a right because some of us in our heart here are still struggling with the love of God. And uh, that God wants to break through. And what that means is what this thing represents, it's a representative being. It's not, in other words, it's not by itself. I can see it, but they have the capacity. They have the capacity because they're in, uh, they're in corporeal beings like the angels to come within one another and come within a person like, like uh, demons there at the, at the man of gatherings as well as uh, the other instance where he threw, threw them into a herd of pigs. So the one, one vessel had thousands of demons in it because they're in a corporeal being, they can travel that way. You can only see one, but it's a representative chief of maybe thousands. Here's my point. What's going on here tonight? Here's what's going on here tonight. There are angels standing beside every one of us in this room. Their objective is to, uh, by the order of God is to uh, remove as if you would strip a bandage off of your heart to remove uh, the hindrance that has been blocking the measure of the love of God from filling us. They know that and that's why they're here. Because what goes on in this is their binding or loosing of their stronghold. They're being loosed from a stronghold. And uh, it becomes an issue with us of a being bound to the Lord in a greater way than ever before by love. The, not by fear, by love. Not motivated by fear, motivated by the love of God. You see what I'm saying? So that's, I'm sorry, I wasn't going to go into all that, but that's why it's, that's why it's here. And so, you know, honestly, Dan, what we want to do is probably me switch into this mode real quick. What we want to do then is, is allow the Lord to take those bandages off. Yeah. You know, those things that, uh, you know, it's not a condemnation type of word. It's a God drawing us by his love to strip off our protection. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah where uh, I, I, I get wounded and I protect myself. And that's what that bandage represents. I get hurt and I protect myself. So here's what we wanna pray right now. Lord, all of those things, whatever they are, remove them right now by the power of the Holy Spirit and let the love of God that's in Christ fill us with such a supernatural, above all understanding and knowledge that God is in love with me. God is for us. Who can be against us? The measure in its height, in its depth, in its width, and in its breadth to be of such greatness, with such power, and such authority that the grip be broken, the chains be broken, the fetters be broken, and that we be free to receive the love of God, believe the love of God, move in the love of God, and allow that love to fill us and flow through us to all others around us. Break the power of condemnation and the power of fear. Break the hurt's power. Replace it with the power of love. Just say that to him. Replace the hurt, Lord, the pain of it, with the power of love. Greater than all other powers. 
We declare this. Here's a declaration. This is an in-your-face. This is why I'm doing this. This is an in-your-face. You can do this with these things. We declare that God is above all. Let's say it. He is above all our circumstances. Above my fears. Above my hurts. Above my pain. He is above the condemnation. He is above my misinterpretation and misunderstanding of Him. And you be exalted in me tonight, Lord. Be exalted in my heart. Be exalted in my mind. In my inward man. Be exalted in my understanding. Go beyond my natural understanding. Take us all to the heights of your love. To heaven itself. To the throne itself. That's the height. To the throne. To the throne of grace. To find help for our time of need. That's to know the love of God at its height. To the throne. You've called us to the throne. You have welcomed us to come boldly before the throne of grace to find help. I ask you to break off the power of failure. All that we feel, Lord, that has, that has perhaps caused us to never be able to enter in fully. Break the failure off of us, the fear of it, the belief of it. We are not failures in Christ. We're a new creation. <laughs> I pray for the hope of God. God's hope. Faith, hope, and love to be here tonight, Lord. Greater than fear. Greater than failure. Greater than condemnation. That we would look at you, Father, and see a smile. See in you, Father, a loving heart. Yes. A loving desire toward us. Yes. A bidding of us to come, not go away. Rewire us, Father. Yes. That we come quickly. We come regularly. We come continuously to you. That we drink, that we eat, and that we partake of you. Rewire us, Father. No more running. No more hiding. Just say it to him. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't call us to hide and run. He called us to come. Come. Not hide, folks. Not run. Come. Come. We come. Tonight we come. Where the enemy had ground, that ground is no longer his. We are the Lord's people. We are the Lord's possession. Just say that. You need to make that your proclamation. We're the Lord's people. We're the Lord's vessels. We're the Lord's congregation. The Lord's inheritance. Then us as saints. We are not our own. We've been bought with a price. Therefore, they have no right over us. Just say that. They have no right over us. God has all right and authority over us. We are His. Woo! That's it. Just raise Woo! your hands to it. Look into His face for a moment. You don't see a scowl. There's no scowl there. See an invitation. Come. Come. Keep coming.